All right. I think we can get started. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Kristen Angel, Associate Director of Advocacy here at NORD. I oversee our Wear Action Network program, which is our grassroots advocacy network. Um, and I work with our wonderful volunteers that are your hosts for the evening. Um, and I'm going to kick things off uh, quickly. I'll put this nice medical and legal disclaimer. We are not able to provide medical advice nor legal advice, um, nor staff or volunteers. Um, this will be available in the chat to read thoroughly if you would like. Uh, and I'm going to kick us off with two short videos and then we will get going. I am Tristan. Angelina. I was Asia. Regina. Maria Sabuja and Javier. I am Cristian and I am from Norway. I live in the United States of America. In Australia. Please do. No gracias. Tunisia, Kenya. My passion is for fashion and design. I love to dance. You serve me. Peter Saltonstall, President and CEO of the National Organization for Rare Disorders. I would like to welcome you to our 2021 Virtual Rare Disease Day event. But before we begin, I'd like to send out a special thank you to all those advocates and others who have spent so much energy and time supporting the rare disease community. So thank you. The role of Rare Disease Day is to bring together advocates and patients from around the world to help tell the story about rare diseases. There are events like this happening virtually all over this country today, and some of the audiences that we're really trying to focus on are those of the state legislatures, where advocates and legislative people come together to understand the burden of rare diseases and the impacts it can have on them, and therefore build the appropriate legislation and pathway to make sure that bills are passed that support rare disease patients. As a matter of fact, NORD's doing that in a very focused way with rare disease advisory councils. We've got them set up down 16 states and are building them in others. I think 2021 is going to be an interesting year for us. The reason I say that is because we've just come off of a very difficult year with a pandemic that's impacted the rare disease community in a number of different ways and has really shown some of the inequities in the healthcare system. For all of you that are watching today, 
the importance of the rare disease advisory councils is critical to the success of being able to communicate the story and the needs of the rare disease patient community. So in conclusion, I would really like to make sure that I recognize and thank all of those sponsors who have helped us make this day a reality. Without your continued support, none of this would happen. So a sincere thank you from all of us at Nord and the patient community. Taking part in events like today's are really important to the rare disease community. And we must always remember that alone we are rare and together we are strong. Great. I am going to swap my screen really quick. Sorry if there were some technical issues. I think some people are having some problem with the video, but hopefully you're able to hear it okay at the very least. Um, okay. So I am excited to introduce um, our volunteer, uh, New York Rare Action Network Volunteer State Ambassadors, uh, Mary Wooten and Sophia Harin. And we have our Community Engagement Liaison for New York RAN, Jessica Asante. And um, our wonderful volunteer tonight that's helping us out in the chat, um, Benji. Benji, how do you say your last name? I'm sorry, I should have learned. Uh, Etienne. <laughs> At the end, I would have messed that up, so I apologize. Oh, All right, Mary, you're on mute. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Great, okay, hi. My name is Mary, and I have been an, a volunteer ambassador with New York RAN for uh, just over three years now. This is my third rare disease day, and I'm so excited to be here with you all. My connection with RARE is um, I have Meniere's disease um, and I have two children who have rare diseases. They each have two rare diseases, um, but not the same as each other. Um, we're looking forward to starting back up with our virtual, with our virtual chat this spring. Um, so if you could please help us out, if you have any topics that you're interested in, um, speaking about doing that during the virtual chats, um, or if you have any other event ideas for us, um, please go ahead and pop them in the chats. And our volunteer Benji is going to record them for us. You can send us an email with ideas if you have some later on. You'll see our emails um, pop up at the screen there. Um, and that's it for me. Um, I'll like to introduce Sophia. Um, my co-ambassador, um, and she'll introduce herself. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hi. Oh, little echo there. Um, my name's Sophia. It's great to, to see you all here tonight. Um, to talk about my connection to RARE, I actually started uh, volunteering with NORAD when I was in undergrad at Northeastern University, and I was the president of the student chapter there. And so I learned so much about rare diseases and the community while I was in undergrad there that I just got so passionate about it and I kept learning more and more. And I actually ended up learning that my um, older brother has a rare disease and I didn't even know it. So it's, I didn't know that it was rare, I knew he had it, but I think it really shows, it's really a testament to how much rare diseases are all around us um, and how important this, this really is. And so, I'm really happy to be volunteering as a state ambassador now. I uh, joined the team back in September, I think, um, October, and I'm really enjoying it. And with that, I will introduce my um, coworker, Jessica. Hi, everyone. My name is Jessica. Um, my connection to Rare is um, I graduated last May from RIT um, with a degree um, and a background in advocacy. And so I reached out to Mary um, in, I think it was the summertime of last year, wanting to volunteer and seeing what I could do um, and wanting to learn more about the rare disease community, just like Sophia. Um, and ever since then, I've been a part of this great team. Um, I've been at each of the virtual chats that Mary mentioned earlier. Um, and yeah, I've been super, super excited to have this event and I'm so glad that you are all here. And yeah, thank you so much for coming. 
Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Benji, who is our volunteer, um, and he'll also be active in the chat. Oh, thank you, Jessica. Hello, everyone. Uh, as you can see already, I am in the chat. So if you have any questions, please feel free to utilize the chat function. Um, and I am also a volunteer that's been working with Jessica, Sophia, and Mary, a wonderful team, really. My connection to Rare is I actually graduated in undergrad with a degree in molecular biology, and I started working in the pharmaceutical industry, just really working in the rare disease therapeutic area. And what really captured my interest is the patients, uh, the patient stories. Um, it, it's very encouraging and very powerful and um, literally happy to be here tonight. Now, I'll kick it back to you, Jessica. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, and like Mary mentioned earlier, if there's anything you guys would like to see from us um, in the next couple of months as we start to pick up on our virtual chats, please feel free to use the chat in this call right now. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to use the chat as well. Um, yeah, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Anissa Reed. I'm the State Policy Manager for the Eastern Region. And I am gonna do an overview of what rare disease advisory councils are and um, talk about our report cards. You can go to the next slide, please. Perfect, so let's start with the problem. So more than 25 million Americans are living with one of more than 7,000 unique rare diseases. So that breaks down to about one in 10 Americans. Even though that might seem like a lot, state decision makers still have limited awareness of the issues and impact that rare diseases have on patients, their caregivers, and the overall healthcare system. Next slide, please. So what is the solution? NOR believes it is to create RDAX, a diverse body to advise state government on the common obstacles that the rare disease community faces. We see this as an enormous opportunity for government officials and the rare disease community to work together to develop resources necessary to prevent and address barriers in a strategic way. There are a number of differences between RDACs. This includes the number of members on their council, varied members of the rare disease community being represented, and differences in the duties. So overall, each RDAC has the same goal of supporting the rare disease community by increasing the voice of rare disease patients and their caregivers. Um, and so as you can see here, so to date, 16 states have passed RDAC legislation. Um, New York is actually one of them, which is really exciting. Um, we also have several other RDAC bills that are currently being heard in several other states. And next slide, please. Perfect, thank you. Uh, as mentioned, so we're thrilled to have passed that legislation in so many states, and we wanna continue increasing the number to give as many rare disease advocates a voice in state government as possible. Uh, NORD highly encourages that different state RDACs collaborate with one another to share ideas and best practices. We plan to continue to develop and release toolkits and one-pagers, host webinars, and convene additional meetings to support ongoing RDAC work. Next slide, please. Great, so as I mentioned, um, New York passed Senate Bill 7172 with identical bi Assembly Bill 9131, which was signed into law in 2019, and a chapter amendment was adopted in 2020 to create a rare disease work group in New York. So we are working with rare disease advocates in New York to get the work group off the ground. Um, the Department of Health has been really busy, of course, with COVID-related matters in New York, which has caused a slight delay in appointing members and activating the work group. But we are looking forward to kicking it into gear soon with the support of our New York uh, rare disease advocates. So some duties that the work group is going to focus on um, is to identify best practices that could improve awareness of rare diseases and evaluate barriers to treatment, including financial barriers on access to care. Next slide, please. Perfect, so now I'm gonna jump into an overview of an important tool that we use at NORD. 
In 2015, NORD launched the State Report Card Project with a goal of evaluating how effectively states are serving people with rare diseases. So this year marks the sixth edition of the State Report Card, which was compiled using data um, as of November 2020. So these are the policy issues that NORD's report card focuses on. Um, it's important to note, however, that these issues are not exhaustive. These issues touch on several critical and relevant policy areas at the state level, but with each issue included, there are still many others that are capable of impacting the lives of rare disease patients. So how do you find out where your state measures up? So you can find it by going to the website that is listed there and looking at each state's page. They're available in printable versions as well. So it is a really handy tool to learn more about what we focus on when it comes to rare disease policy issues. Uh, so next slide, please. So uh, these are just small snapshots of some policy issues that impact the rare disease community um, in 2020. So current legislation and changes that have been made so far in 2021 have not yet been captured. So if your state recently passed some legislation to improve one of the policy issues, it's likely not going to be reflected until our seventh edition. Um, so the website, it also provides a really detailed overview of the data, and you can learn more about each policy issue in the methodology section. Uh, next slide, please. Great, so if you have any questions about our report card, then you can always send us an email at policy at rarediseases.org. Perfect, I'll turn it back over to our New York volunteers. Amazing, thank you so much for that update. Um, it's great to see everything that's going on. Um, so I just want to take this time to introduce our first patient speaker, um, Tara, and she can take it away. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. Hi, my name is Tara Notrika, and I reside in Merrick, Long Island. I just want to say, first off, thank you so much to the entire team for providing me the opportunity to share my story um, with everybody this evening. So I am a rare disease patient who has a disease called mast cell disease. Um, my particular variant is mast cell activation disorder. Um, my health journey was very extensive. Um, <clears throat> I began having episodes of anaphylaxis in my 20s, and it would include me developing hives all over my body. I would develop facial swelling, constriction of airways, vomiting, diarrhea, my blood pressure would plummet. And the episodes happened very infrequently, maybe once a year. Um, they did require ER visits. And initially I was taken to the hospital and treated with IV Benadryl and epinephrine um, back at the time. As the years went on, um, the episodes became more intense and more frequent. And by the time I was 40, um, they were just unbearable. Uh, prior to all of that, I actually visited many uh, medical facilities throughout the country, including most of the major medical facilities in New York, including um, NYU, Columbia, Cornell Weill, MSK, Lenox Hill. So I was a patient at those institutions. I also visited other uh, facilities throughout the country, including the National Institutes of Health, the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, Yale University, a couple of facilities in Boston until I was ultimately diagnosed after five years of being diagnosed with um, different diseases that really were not the root cause of my illness, uh, including such diseases as rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, scleroderma, mixed connective tissue disease, and Raynaud's phenomenon. And the episodes just kept happening. I was seen by many, many disciplines, including rheumatology, pulmonology, cardiology, endocrinology, um, allergy, immunology, hematology, and it was very, very difficult for the physicians to figure out um, what was going on. 
Um, some of the diagnoses, which included chronic fatigue syndrome and severe clinical depression, uh, were a little bit more difficult for me to understand because first off, um, I, I said to the panel that diagnosed me with chronic fatigue syndrome that I really didn't understand because I wasn't tired. Um, prior to getting sick, I was a full-time working mom who never stopped. And even though I was going through all of these things, I was still getting up to try and keep my family functioning as normally as possible and trying to be involved with my children. So five years, a, a lot of different, I'm going to say compassion usage medication trials, including immune modulating uh, drugs, immunosuppressive drugs, chemotherapy agents, and nothing was working until, like I said, I was diagnosed in um, April 1st of 2011. By the point of diagnosis, I was 100 pounds. I was on a feeding tube 12 hours a day. I had lost about 50% of my muscle mass and it was pretty questionable as to whether or not I was gonna make it. I saw a world expert up at Brigham and Women's who deals with mast cell disease and it took her about an hour to diagnose me. Um, my husband actually led me to see her because he found a very strong correlation between things that were showing up in my blood work, which consisted of very high levels of the immunoglobulin IgE and high blood histamine levels. So that's how I came to the doctor and the diagnosis. I was immediately put on a very intensive uh, treatment plan for mast cell diseases. And it did stop the anaphylactic type of reactions because by the point of diagnosis, I, I was having them probably three to four times a week. I was constantly in the ER, um, long-term admissions, because like I said, they really didn't know what was going on. And luckily my condition improved, um, but it was not life altering for me. Um, which is what brought me to Memorial Sloan Kettering in um, New York City. And I started uh, to first consult with um, a hematologist and we tried different uh, chemotherapy agents to try and put this in, in some type of remission status. Nothing worked and in I was then referred to the head of, um, actually, I'm sorry, the chief of, at the time, stem cell transplantation and bone marrow transplantation. And after a, a lot of consultations and, and a lot of heart-to-heart -heart, um, discussions and a lot of, you know, um, really climbing through hoops, uh, it was decided that I would first do an autologous stem cell transplant utilizing my own stem cells to try and reset my immune system. That was done in 2015. Unfortunately, it was not successful. So we had to wait uh, some time for me to kind of rebound and, and become strong enough to do my next transplant, which was done in 2018, and that was an allogeneic bone marrow transplant with an unrelated donor from Be The Match. So again, a lot of heart to heart, um, a lot of um, peer to peer conversations between my physician and my insurance company. Um, so, the, these are all things um, which I'm hoping will raise awareness as to how much we need to do better for rare disease patients, for their caregivers, for um, the medical community, for the community at large, because as I mentioned, it took an extremely long time for me to get diagnosed. There were not very many treatments that were available for me. 
Um, there is no cure for mast cell disease. Some patients go on to develop mast cell leukemia and oftentimes um, you don't survive it. So in a sense, I'm, I'm very, very lucky that I was fortunate enough to, you know, have a, a doctor that was on my side and we took the chance together to do this. Um, I'm still recuperating. I had a tremendous amount of complications. I'm not going to say it was easy by any means. I developed graft versus host disease, whereby I actually started rejecting my donor cells. Um, I developed um, hemolytic anemia in which I was attacking my red blood cells. I developed two bouts of pneumonia and I had a reactivation of Epstein-Barr disease. All of these required extensive inpatients hospital stays and a tremendous amount of uh, treatment. Currently, you know, I continue taking daily medication, some um, immunosuppressive medication. I'm on monthly treatments to prevent pneumonia and other medications as well. So that is, you know, a daily regimen uh, for me. So again, I can't say enough. It has not been a, an easy journey by any means. On the bright side of all of this, I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to share my story in, in a documentary. Um, as you can see on the screen, it's called Second Chance, and it is about getting a second chance at life. Um, the filmmaker is Matthew White. He's from Fourth Coast Productions located in Rochester, New York, and he was really taken by my story and decided he was going to spend about two weeks filming um, my family members, close friends of the family. Um, he interviewed some people that are involved in the music business because we tell the story through original songs, which were co-written and recorded by my now. Now she's 16, during filming she was 14 years old. So I'm pretty proud uh, of the incredible job that she did. And you can see on the screen, um, this was actually a transplant day for me. So they did come in and do filming prior to me being admitted, my day of admission and transplant day. And then they came back and filmed for um, when I was discharged and came home for the first time after spending over two months in, in the hospital. So the film is actually in the film circuit right now. Um, our purpose is to raise awareness about rare diseases, educate about the bone marrow transplant process, encourage more people to become donors. Uh, we do get into some legislation and to show how music has healing powers. The film will actually be screened in the Garden State Film Festival, which takes place at the end of March. And we just won an award for Best Family Original Song and Composition. Uh, the title of that song is called Second Chance, and it is about finding your perfect uh, bone marrow donor and getting a second chance at life. Um, we're actually doing a radio interview tomorrow uh, evening. So again, we're going to be talking about my rare disease and it is in honor of Rare Disease Day. So that's my story. I, I thank you again for providing me the opportunity to share and to hopefully continue to raise awareness. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Tara. Um, and some of you might recall that we've shared the link for the trailer for Tara's documentary on our Facebook page um, in the past. And we'll do that again for you soon, Tara. Um, so everyone watch out for that. Um, next up, we'd like to introduce Jason and Nola to share their story. Thank you. Here we go, can we hear me? Hi everybody, how are you? So, uh, thank you very much for having me here tonight. I have to thank Mary and Sophia 
for the endless string of emails, mostly how the heck does this Zoom thing work and what button do I press? So they're they're phenomenal. My uh, my journey into the rare world is, is sitting right next to me. This is Nola, she's four years old. Very happy to be here. Nola, hip hip. There we go. That's how she feels about rare day. Um, about 18 months after uh, Nola was born, we got her diagnosis. Leading up to that, she was having a lot of uh, delays. She was not sitting up. Or she had really bad torticollis, horrible acid reflux, missed every milestone. And doctors would just periodically tell us every child develops a different rate. No worries, it'll be fine. And as anybody dealing with a rare disease knows, it, it's perseverance. It's thinking you know more than the doctor, which often is, as a parent, is what flips that switch. So we applied to early intervention, got denied, applied again, got in. So we did some early intervention work. We did a bunch of therapy and uh, we still really weren't getting anywhere. It was still very slow. We had, we had little or no speech, very bad muscle weakness. Uh, it, it, it was very, very frustrating. I, uh, I had taken her for a regular appointment. She had a little bit of a cold and uh, an older doctor walked in and he said, look, I think she has Down syndrome. I think you may want to get her tested. Never heard it before, never thought of it before. So we did a genetic test, didn't think anything of that. About a month later, we come back, regularly scheduled checkup, and a doctor comes up from downstairs with a Google printout and tells me she has chromosome 18Q deletion. And he really doesn't know anything, so he's gonna have to basically Google that and find out what we should do. So needless to say, my world stopped turning for me pretty much on that day. I had no idea what to do. Uh, her mom had no idea what to do. I've never even heard, I've never heard of chromosome 18. I, I didn't know anything about rare diseases. I had a child for 18 months. I, I didn't know anything. So we began to, you know, the usual, the shock sets in and the anger. And then you realize, you know, speed bump. It's just a step. We'll overcome this. It's parenting. Parenting 101. Life does not cooperate. So we went to see a geneticist. A geneticist, uh, I remember him telling me that with a lot of hard work and a lot of therapy, one day Noah will be able to tie her shoes. That ended about as well as you thought it would end. So we moved on from that very quickly. And we sought out another geneticist and another battery of doctors who are absolutely phenomenal and fantastic. And we went through every test everyone goes through. And we find now that physically we, we, we've overcome a lot of hurdles. Medically, we're clear from the things we really need to be worried about. We deal now with uh, hearing loss, low muscle tone. She eats everything in my house. And, you know, it's just, it's a long, slow process to get her to where she, we know she's capable of being. So in the middle of all this, I found myself really wanting to, to get involved, to do something, because I didn't know anything. I Googled chromosome 18, and I got a Wikipedia page, and then I got the chromosome 18 website, chromosome18.org. I reached out to them, continued to Google. I reached out, I found Nord. I reached out to them. Chromosome 18 was nice enough to uh, ask me to apply to become the Northeast Regional Coordinator, which I did, which has been a phenomenal experience. I love everything about that. Uh, my journey into advocacy was uh, actually NORD because um, I received an email one day asking me if I would like to have Nola come for a photo shoot because she's, she's adorable. So, you know, we went and did the photo shoot. They told me they had a few slots available aside from Nola. So I had called up people on my job and I asked them, look, I know we have a large, large department. I know we have a lot of people dealing with these issues. Somebody want to come out. And about 10 o'clock at night, I get a phone call on my cell phone from uh, Kevin O'Connor. You're going you're gonna to hear from him or his wife here today also. And he said to me, hey, Jason, you know what? We're doing a rare disease day. I'd really like you to be a part of it. I said, sounds great, sir. What do I do? He said, you come to one police plaza, you talk in front of the commissioner of the whole department. I said, oh, boy. So... I reached out to Chromosome 18. They showed up in force. It was phenomenal. I had my table. The department made me this lovely picture behind me that now hangs on my wall. And it was at that moment I realized that advocacy, I realized that was the one thing that's going to turn the tide. That's really going to make this something that we can all take part in and something that we can all benefit from. Because we don't, the word rare in of itself tells us the battle that we're fighting. We don't have the reach. We don't have the publicity. We, a lot of times people don't know. You tell them, oh, Nola's got chromosome 18. And oh, I'm sorry. Sorry for what, I have no idea. But we really need to be out there. We need people to realize that, excuse me guys, sorry. 
that we need the help, we need the recognition, we need the funding, we need the legislation. And the only way to do that is to be present. We have rare disease day, we have rare disease month. As parents, we, we live a rare disease life. I call us the special forces of parenting because the pandemic hit and everybody was concerned, you know, I have to wash my hands, I gotta wear my gloves, I gotta wear my mask. A lot of us have kids with autoimmune diseases. That's every day of our life. Every single day we have our mask, our gloves. We have to worry on a level a lot of people don't worry on. On top of that, homeschooling is difficult. We do home therapy. I do so much teletherapy with Nola for, for such a long time that she won't even look at an iPad now without yelling at me. Nola, thank you. So, okay, okay, honey, I love you. So basically, it, it just becomes a question of how much you can do with what you have and how much you can do with what you don't have. We need to stay on top of what we do, which is as parents, as advocates, is, is to me the most important part of this. We, we fight every day. Every day of our life is a different struggle. It's not worse, it's just different. And through organizations like Chromosome 18, which has been amazing to me, and Nord, which has been unbelievable to me, it's given me the opportunity to speak to people on a level where they understand what it is that we're, that we're dealing with now. That it's not an I'm sorry moment. It's a, oh, can we help? What can we do? And you can direct them. I've got a lot of my friends, a lot of my coworkers have logged on tonight and it's, it, it's a wonderful thing. I love that they're getting involved. And then you add on top of all the things we deal with, you add with, you add the pressure of time. There was a period of time for a month, I worked 12 hour days, seven days a week without a day off. But in between that, I had tele teletherapy. I had 15, 20 sessions a week that had to be accomplished. And at the end of that, there was no school to send her to. So every day that a child without a rare disease is out of school, they suffer from, you know, different social issues, not being with their friends, not playing sports. Every day our children are out of therapy, out of school, they lose a day. They don't necessarily get the therapy they need. NOLA doesn't talk as much as I would like her to. We learn sign language. We put that aside. We got the hearing device. We got a Baja hearing device that we find out is not covered by insurance. So yet another hurdle we all deal with every single day is how do we pay these bills? Which is again, why the legislation, why the outreach, why the fundraising is all so important. And I'm sorry. Okay, honey, not a toy. So basically what, what I come to with all this, when I sit, when I reflect on it, when I look at what goes on day to day is that Nord, Chromosome 18, organizations like that, they really give that voice. They give that ability for parents to speak for their kids. They give us the ability to show our kids off to people who really appreciate the small gains, like waiting over two years to hear daddy was, was a big moment. And it was something that I, that I, it just can't be replaced. But I had to wait longer than a lot of people have to wait. And believe me, it was, it was worth every second. I'm sorry. <laughs> like trying to uh, herd cats with her today. But, you know, like I had mentioned before, the biggest thing with me is, is we, we, I like to say we celebrate Rare Disease Day. We celebrate Rare Disease Month because in a lot of ways, it's, it's a celebration. It's a celebration that we're here. It's a celebration that our kids are here. And it's, I don't like to say there's a reason that this happens or we're chosen for any specific purpose, but it, any parent will agree with me, any person suffering from a rare disease will agree that the minute you know this is a part of your life, your first reaction, your first impulse is how can I help? What can I do? How can I help other people? And you only can help other people through Nord, Chromosome 18. You can only help them through getting out there and showing them the positives, not only the negatives, and just showing them just how strong we can really be. So I'm gonna wrap up because we have a lot of people and I'm surprised you know, I was able to speak as long as I was, anybody who knows me. But I always say, and it's in a lot of the things that I write, it's a lot of the profiles I post, it's that, you know, without NOLA having this diagnosis, my life would be very, very different. But in absolutely no way would my life be any better. I have met some amazing people, some inspirational people, and I'm a better person, a better father, and a better human because of my daughter and because of the people that I've met along the way. So I thank you all from the bottom of my heart. I wish every one of you peace, strength, and please keep doing what you're doing because you're making this world go round for all of us. Thank you. 
And Jason, I just want to add, thank you for speaking, but um, I, I know you were talking, so uh, if you have a chance to go back to the chat, because uh, both you and Nola are getting at a lot of love, but I'm not going to lie, Nola's getting more. <laughs> this, is a, this is the tightest shirt I have. I don't know what else I can do at this point. I've got to be honest with you. I, don't, I, don't, I have no idea what to do. I mean, I, I said I did, the, uh, I did the photo shoot, and I was under no illusions that anybody there wanted to take pictures of me. So... Well, my girl, I love, her. I love her to death. And I think that's okay with everybody here. Uh, it's my girl. I love everything about every minute of my day. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Jason and Nola, for sharing your story. And Jason already partially introduced for me Kevin and Danielle and their daughter, um, Emily. So, um, Danielle, would you like to start off? and share your story with us. Thanks. Hi, I'm not Danielle. <laughs> Sorry, I can't see the screen. I wasn't sure who was there. I just pushed her out of the way, so I'm gonna start. Uh, so my name is Kevin O'Connor and uh, I'm here with my wife, Danielle, and we have uh, Emily. And Emily has uh, San Filippo syndrome. Um, short name is MPS3A. So, um, you know, I was listening to Tara and then Jason and, you know, it's almost like we can duplicate and go ditto on a lot of the things everyone's saying, but that's, that's what brings all these rare diseases together. So Emily was diagnosed 16 years ago. Well, no, what? five, no, <laughs> no, 11 years ago. Sorry. She's 16 now. So, uh, 11 years ago, she was diagnosed after a long fight trying to figure out what was going on. She was born absolutely beautiful, full head of hair, black, dark black hair and happy baby. Um, we tease our youngest daughter that if Ella was born first, we probably never would have had another kid again. And we have six kids between us. Um, Emily was just the perfect little baby growing up. And then um, she got into the twos and the threes and she was the Energizer Bunny on steroids, bouncing off the walls, couldn't sit still, um, speaking, running, um, probably did more laps from the living room to the dining room uh, than I can even count. Uh, we put her into a program preschool and the first day they, called us and said, I'm sorry, she can't come here anymore. And we were already trying to figure out what was going on with her. And she had, doctors had told us she was ADHD. She might have a slight bit of autism, just guessing games. There was no real uh, diagnosis. Um, so we started realizing there was more to this because we weren't seeing everything because we see her every day, but my wife was really the person that kept pushing the envelope with the doctors, trying to figure out what was going on. And probably about two years later, when Emily kept getting chronic ear infections, uh, my ENT uh, agreed to see her. And he says, I need to, I can't take her tonsils out uh, at age five without a sleep study. Now, this is a kid that's bouncing off the walls 18 hours a day. And you expect me to let, and, and it's amazing with all the advances in medicine, they still put a thousand wires onto your head with gel. And that's how they expect you to sleep. Uh, even as an adult, it's impossible. Uh, but we got through it. And my ENT was reviewing the pediatrician's reports. And he looked at them and he said, they have never made a notation about her tonsils. It's always ears, ears, ears. Uh, ear infection here, ear infection there. But meanwhile, her tonsils were the size of golf balls. Um, and I said, well, because she's so rambunctious, they have a hard time looking down his throat. And he goes, that's what tongue depressors were created for. So he was aggravated. And he basically told us, get rid of your pediatrician. So we did get a new pediatrician and she was absolutely phenomenal. Um, probably within the first month after speaking to the ENT, she had done some blood tests and had, she had an inkling of what it was, but wouldn't say until she got a confirmation back. And we were literally just getting home from uh, my mother-in-law's funeral. We had walked in the door. I went to work and my wife calls me bawling that 
they finally figured out what's going on and she's going to die. And I'm like, I'm sure it's not that bad. I'm sure it's not what you're thinking. And I'm just trying. And there were no words that I could uh, talk to my wife about to calm her down. So I left work and came home. And sure enough, like Jason had mentioned, the first thing you do is Google things. And when we Google it, it's basically a death sentence. This, the uh, disorder is basically saying they can die anywhere from age five to 15. They usually don't make it through their teenage years. So everything was wrong with what we read. Um, so fast forward, we started, uh, you get through that first stage. We couldn't even tell the kids at first because they were coming into their finals for in the month of June. This was May. So in the month of June, they're going into testing and we held it to ourselves. They, they really just assumed they were, uh, mom was upset because her own mom had passed. So a couple of weeks go by and we finally try to explain it to the kids as best we could because we still didn't understand. And then we kicked into a different gear. Um, with the new pediatrician, um, we started uh, looking at different things that we had to do, a neurologist, a geneticist, um, you know, you, you name a background, cardiologist. My wife has figured out who the best person is for each part. Um, I'm alone for the ride. I'm learning from her but she does all the hard work. Um, and we finally got it to a point where we realized, and this is where her, uh, her uh, part, of, part of this will come in, is how do we take this to a different level? So with the rare illnesses, the biggest thing is uh, awareness. So we started the Facebook page. We put San Filippo syndrome in the name of the Facebook page. So when people Google that, Emily's page pops up quite often. People see our page first before they see the Google report. Um, we had mentioned, Jason mentioned with work, um, police department is a very good thing when it comes to getting the word out. So we had a boxing match and we didn't do it just for Emily. We identified families across the country and we actually had Los Angeles come into New York and they call it a smoker where cops actually fight cops for charity. And these guys are as good as any professional fighters. And we had the East Coast versus the West Coast where Emily was the captain of the East Coast team with the NYPD. And we had a family that had helped us through our first year or two, uh, the Bennetts, who actually had three children with San Filippo syndrome. And because it's a genetic disorder, um, it's all based on math and genes. We could have had two kids easily because when Emily, uh, was born, she was fine. We decided we wanted to have another kid and we had Ella. And as soon as Emily was diagnosed, we we're like, dear God, we may have two kids with it. It's really just uh, luck of the draw at that point because it's too late. Um, the Bennett's actually had three children with San Filippo, you know, the Irish twins uh, phenomenon. They just had a couple of kids and before they figured out there was something wrong, all three kids were basically diagnosed after the fact. Um, so all that comes into play and then you get into a different mode and you can't keep thinking this is, she's going to die tomorrow. She's going to die next Thursday. You have to get past that. So with the events that we held, the boxing match, uh, rare disease day. Now, this is our third year. We're doing the virtual on Sunday, um, just to keep the bridge from last year to next year. Hopefully we're going to highlight a new, new family with a rare disease. Um, talk about some of the things we've done over the last two years. Nord was a great partner last year with us. We actually put the logo on a police department vehicle, uh, changed all the lights to the colors. I think you guys even posted it on your main page. Um, we're doing that again this year. Um, and we're going to take it on the road since we can't have everything at one event. And we're going to visit children's hospitals throughout the New York City area. We're going to go to the Ronald McDonald houses in New York, where we will come across families that are going through therapies or doctor's appointments with rare disease. So we're going to take our show on the road this year, um, starting Monday. And we have a couple of families we've already identified. We're going to show up outside the house, turn on the lights that are not the typical police lights. They're actually the color of your logo. Um, so all these things have helped us get through these things. Uh, and We've, we've realized it doesn't matter if you have this illness or that illness or, you know, something you've never heard of, 
the Nord site has become our default site to refer people to rather than Google. It's very well explained. There's compassion in the, po the, the way it's written. They, they have an understanding of how to present this to a family that's coming into this world that they never wanted to be part of. Um, the family I'm talking about, the Del, Rose, uh, Del Rosario family, we built the bridge with them. I actually am able to use your site to understand what his illness, uh, child's illness is and get an understanding of where he's coming from. And that's enabled us to uh, bond, so to speak, with other families. And in our world, because it is so rare, the social media and what Danielle is doing with Team San Filippo, we have family, as far as we're concerned, they're family across the world now. She was on the phone till 11 o'clock last night with a mom trying to get through some issues, looking at a video of a child's uh, spasms and reactions, trying to figure out what it was from a mom's perspective and then how to deal with that with the doctors. And again, fighting with doctors all the time, figuring out which doctor, compassionate use of medicines, all of that comes into play like Tara and Jason have both uh, talked about. Um, but happy to say 11 years later, we had our Sweet 16 birthday parade on Saturday. We had police cars, sheriff cars, people screaming and yelling, a DJ playing SpongeBob on, on a speaker, balloons donated from other people. The goodwill just keeps coming. Um, and that's what keeps us going forward with the, dealing with a rare disease. And then events like the one you're putting together tonight is just building new relationships and friendships with people that are dealing with basically the same thing we are and just fighting for the quality of life and the daily day-to-day -day, uh, happiness that we should all go through. So um, she just disappeared on me. So what Danielle has also done is she's joined with two other moms and a, a father and they've created the Team San Filippo Foundation. And their job is the advocacy, can never say the word, the advocacy of going to state legislatures, the federal government, going down to DC, uh, putting out um, information for families, but also funding research and raising money to be able to fund trials with different pharmaceuticals that are trying different things to figure out how to cure the lysosomal disorder. And just real short and the best way I could describe it, her illness is basically, um, she has, everyone has the four enzymes, which is where you see the letter A, it's A, B, C, and D. She's missing one of those enzymes because of the genetic match. And her body is not able to um, digest food or proteins down at a microscopic level. And over time, it builds up causing loss of speech. She, can, she lost her ability to walk alone about three years ago. Um, she has a feeding tube for now for about two years. So again, like Jason said, dealing with things as they come along, parent 101 kicks in and you just uh, deal with different issues going forward. So I, I hope I gave a, a pretty decent overall uh, point, but to Jason's last point, I have a better life and I'm a better person. Sorry, because of my daughter. So she's taught us how to live. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Danielle to talk about Team San Filippo. Just real quick, just tell them what it is. You have time, Danielle. That, well, I, I'd rather talk about Emily. Um, I know Kevin, Kevin knows the police department. So Kevin kind of went off on the police department and what they're doing for Rare Disease Day. Um, and, you know, as far as Emily goes, um, I know he talked about the, you know, she had, she had a little bit of problem. We saw the doctor, but to get into San Filippo, what happens is the children are born, um, depending on which type they have, there are four types of San Filippo, A, B, C, and D. And depending on the type of San Filippo they have, they're missing an enzyme that helps break down um, lysosomes. So it's a lysosomal storage disorder. Each day, every single one of us makes these 
We uh, recycle them daily. The San Filippo kids are missing. We like to tell people it's like the garbage man doesn't come clean up. So um, the gags are mucopolysaccharides gather in every single cell of the body, depending on the individual severity of the child, that will determine um, when you start to notice things are changing. They're, they're born very typically, they gain skill typically, and then again, depending on their own independent severity, because siblings even with the same parents tend to have a completely different development, they will start to decline. Um, Emily had hundreds of words. She just didn't string the words together quite like my older girls did. So I took her for um, hearing tests just to see maybe that's what's wrong. And she did have hearing loss, both ears, mild in one, mild to moderate in the other. Um, so we assumed this was our problem. This was our very first diagnosis. And, um, you know, you, you find out after you understand what you're dealing with after you join the community, absolutely every single child with San Filippo has hearing loss. Um, so you start dealing with that. You have the ADHD, which almost all of them are diagnosed with. Whether it's a true diagnosis or not is debatable. I don't believe it is because it's a, a product of the illness that goes away. True ADHD doesn't go away. Um, the same thing with autism. Um, we had Emily at DDI, which also had an autism school inside of it. And they said, don't ever let them give her an autism diagnosis. She does not have autism. We don't know what it is, but it's not this. So um, anyway, back to the progression of the illness. Once, once they reach a certain point, they start to lose the, um, the decline is for a typical severe child like Emily, kind of slow. You don't, you really don't notice that, um, you know, words are being lost until you turn around and all of a sudden there are none. And you can't remember the last time you heard um, milk was her first word or mom or um, she would chase Ella around baby stinky butt. Things like that that you took for granted and always happen are just in your mind suddenly gone. But it was a gradual thing. Um, she's 16 years old today. She is 100% full need. She has zero speech. Um, she depends on us for absolutely every aspect of her life. A feeding tube was um, put in when she was 13 years old. She did, actually, she still can eat orally, but aspiration is a big issue. Um, you know, it's it's a challenge. She doesn't aspirate, but we're very careful with, um, we'll wipe her mouth. very careful with what we do feed her, what she does drink. Um, it is a terminal illness. There are absolutely no treatments. There's nothing. I am on the executive board of Team San Filippo Foundation, and we are, work tirelessly. I'm in the city constantly with geneticists, researchers. Hi, Vivi. Um, other, um, let me scoot, she can come in. Other people trying to, um, you know, see what we can do. We, you know, team up with other foundations. We um, go in with gene therapy, everything to try to come up with something. So it, everything so far has failed. We don't give up hope. We keep fighting. We do the best we can do. And, um, you know, until then, like you'll, you'll see if you Google it, that it's um, listed as childhood Alzheimer. It is, if you got rid of that background, um, it's not like Alzheimer's and the people just think that because they lose skill, it's Alzheimer's. When, if anyone has ever had a family member with Alzheimer's, you know, they go through different struggles where they don't know you. Emily knows who we are. There's no doubt. She can't say who we are, but she knows who we are. Um, she is so happy. If you have had a loved one with Alzheimer's, you know they're, they're, they have bursts of anger, things like that. Emily doesn't. So, um, you know, she sees a slew of doctors. I have lab work done every four to six months, depending on what's going on, what her lab work shows. We adjust accordingly. She takes 10 million vitamins. Um, only to keep up whatever lab values show deficits. Not, you know, I don't think it's curing anything. We literally do it to supplement what her body isn't doing. And um, 
since there is no real treatment, it's a little different for every parent. I do advocate as a member, like he said, and um, I, I do the best to help other parents know what has worked well for us because for a severe, Emily is, has been on borrowed time for, for years as a severe patient. So, um, you know, we just thank God every day. And, uh, you know, I, I pray that everything that I do makes a big difference, not only for Emily, but for the other kids that we work with. Emmy, say hi. Say bye, everybody. You tell them I got my jammies. You got your jammies on? Yeah. Thank you, guys. Do you have a towel or something? Thank you. Thank you so much. Danielle and Kevin and Emily for sharing your story with us. We really appreciate it. Um, so I'd like to transition next um, to make um, an announcement, kind of exciting, um, that Senator Rivera has announced that the Rare Disease Day resolution was adopted um, on February 24th. Um, thank you so much, Senator Rivera, for your support. Um, as always, we know that we can count on you. And I would like to share with you, Kristen's gonna help us out here, um, Assembly Member McDonald um, from the 108th District has sent us a video to watch. Hi, my name is John McDonald, member of the New York State Assembly, and I represent the 108th Assembly District, which is in the capital region here in Albany, uh, of Albany, Troy, and the five cities surrounding the area. Um, I am also a pharmacist. Um, I practice pharmacy at my hometown pharmacy. Pharmacy has been in our family for over 90 years, Maris Pharmacy in downtown Cohoes. It's been an honor and privilege over the past several years to pass a resolution as we do, as we did um, on February 24th, uh, claiming and asking the governor to proclaim that that day is Rare Disease Awareness Day. It's been a pleasure to work with the National Organization of Rare of rare disorders, or NORD as it's called, and all of the partner agencies and organizations. Um, because as a healthcare professional, one of the few in the New York State Legislature, I get it. I understand it. Um, medicine, let's face it, has made tremendous advances over the past several decades. And as much as it made some, some tremendous advances, we know that we have much more work to do particularly when it comes to rare diseases. Our reason for passing this resolution each and every year is to share the message that we need additional investment, additional support to find the cures and the remedies for rare diseases. As we live out our days today, we know that many people are struggling working through the maladies of these rare diseases. My heart goes out to them. They are our heroes. And to the family members, I share your concern. Please know that you have many friends in the New York State Legislature who support your purpose, who want to fight side by side with you as we advocate for more research and funding support to tackle these rare diseases. Thank you. Great. Okay. Mary, do you want me to um Oops, sorry guys, I'm in a tech issue here. Thank you. Mary, do you want do you want me to cover this part and just announce what's going to happen? <laughs> yes, please. No problem. Sorry, everybody. My computer is lagging. It's not for a lack of awkward silence. I apologize. 
Um, so this lovely swag bag that you see here on the um, screen, we are going to be drawing a door prize uh, after the event tonight. So um, keep an eye out in your emails and you could win this lucky prize pack. Uh, and we will email the winner um, tomorrow. So good luck. We do have one video uh, more that I want to show and then um, I know that uh, our wonderful volunteers have planned a nice uh, zebra pageant and I do encourage everybody to stay on after the video to participate in that um, and win a chance to win another one of those nice swag bags I just showed. So I'm going to uh, quickly swap out my screen here and we will show the final video. It's a very quick one. day in February, the National Organization for Rare Disorders joins together with others around the world to raise awareness of the challenges faced by people living with rare diseases. Achieving health equity is even more difficult for rare patients. To have equity in health means everyone has an opportunity to be as healthy as possible, regardless of social, geographic, economic, or other obstacles that may be working against them. At Nord, we appreciate your support, which allows us to work on issues like health equity and many others, and for our staff and volunteers to bring them to the forefront on Rare Disease Day. From the Volunteer State Ambassadors, we would like to say thank you to all of our Rare Action Network supporters for helping us connect with rare patients and families in our state. And thank you for allowing the Rare Action Network to raise important issues with state lawmakers on Rare Disease Day and throughout the year. Did you know that in medical school, I was told, when you hear hoofbeats, they think horses, not zebras. But what about the more than 25 million Americans living with a rare disease? At Nord, we are humbled to provide help and resources to our zebras and their caregivers. Nord support allowed me to catch up on some overdue bills, including my rent. Thank you for your support, Nord, and thank you for supporting Rare Disease Day. From all of us at Nord, thank you for your dedication to the rare disease community. On Rare Disease Day, and every day. All right, Mary, I'm going to, Jessica, guys, I'm going to pass it on to you guys. Yep. So um, thank you all for joining um, for our event tonight. We've had such a great turnout. Um, and this kind of concludes the end of our main programming. Um, but if you guys would like to stick around, we're doing a Show Your Stripes pageant. Um, so if you have any zebra print or if you have any stripes you want to show off, um, we'll give each person about 10 seconds to show us their stripes. And whoever has the best um, zebra swag will win a prize. And um, if you see someone, um, that you think should win, please vote in the chat. Um, so yeah, we're going to get that started right now. So if you want to show your stripes, um, just speak and we'll spotlight you. May I add, please, that you do not have to show your stripes. Oh, oh, there you go. I cut off. I'm sorry. I just also want to add that you do not have to participate in the pageant to say on and vote for your favorite. Okay. We have Danielle and, and uh, Commissioner O'Connor over there. Yeah, woo! I love those shirts. Thanks. Mary, you know it's coming, right? <laughs> oh, he I, better I, not. I, see ya. I can only imagine. Who's next? Raise your hand. Everybody help me look at I can show off my skirt. I have my zebra print skirt on with my not matching um, turtleneck that is also striped. <laughs> yes, yes, love it. <laughs> I 
Well, I'll just share while you folks are, are waiting, but I have our um, Living Rare, Living Stronger Patient and Family Forum from uh, when we were in Houston, and it's got a little uh, cowboy on it. <laughs> it's one of my favorite Norn shirts that I've got, so I figured I'd share that. And on that note, I do want to give a quick shout out to Mary Wooten, who's actually going to be honored this year at our Rare Impact Awards following our Living Rare, Living Stronger Patient and Family Forum in June. Mary's being recognized for all the work she's done with the New York RAND program um, and, you know, just being a, a rock star advocate for the rare disease community at large. So congrats, Mary. Have to give you a shout out. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kristen. And my daughter just brought me these glasses. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> awesome. Um, I think I just saw that Jason and Nola raised their hands in the chat to go next. Ready, Nola? We <laughs> Thank have you, our Ashley. First, we have our first zebra that we got the day we did our photo shoot for Nord, kicking the whole thing off. Show me zebra. Ready? Hit this. <laughs> I know, I know what uh, Kevin O'Connor wants to put on here, so we're all just waiting for that right now. So, uh, boss, if you want to do it, just go ahead. I was waiting for this year's outfit, not for the old one. This year's outfit's hanging in the closet if everybody really wants to see it that badly. Yes, we do. I shall return. Okay. I just have my shirt hanging in the background. It's actually the back of it, so I couldn't wear it. Um, and it lists a load of rare disease patients. Well, I just have my um, Show Your Stripe shirt with a beautiful zebra on it. <laughs> I can also show off the shirt I got from the conference last. I can't, you can't see it well with the background, but <laughs> it has a, a zebra with a little cowboy hat on it. I love that. And my, um, yeah, those are, those are, those I are love the cowboy zebra. Our Houston uh, patient and family forum. This year it's actually virtual. Uh, for in June, but uh, hopefully we'll be back traveling. The event does travel every year to different cities. You know, I'm one of the ones pushing for New York City. So. That would be great. Do we have anyone else that would like to participate and show their stripes? Oh my goodness, we have a unicorn that's just... <laughs> that's pretty good, Jason, I'm not gonna lie. Jason and Nola the unicorn. He doesn't know the difference between a zebra and a unicorn, though, but we'll take it. <laughs> They're both rare and unique. <laughs> hip, hip. Hooray! I don't see how this is helpful. People have suffered enough without me wearing a giant unicorn one day, to be honest. Well, horses, zebras, unicorns, they all sound the same when they walk, right? God help me. It makes that corduroy sound when your legs crisscross, right? Same as the... Now you got to get Nola a matching outfit. Yeah. So who, who did we have today? We had, we, we've got Jason, obviously. We can't forget that very easily. <laughs> um, who else we got, Mary? We had Danielle and Kevin. And we have Tara with her, with her, um, her zebra ribbon shirt with um, the, the rare disease patient's names. Awesome. So I think uh, we can send each of you guys a prize for that. So I, um, you know, the one thing about being in charge of the program is I get to make some executive decisions. So I'm going to send uh, each of you that participated uh, a swag bag like you saw on the, the screen. So thank you guys. That was awesome. I loved seeing everyone's outfits. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Thank I you. I appreciate it. I think I've worn the same shirt the past three years, so next year I'll have a new one. 
Well, I'm on so many of these calls like this week, I have to like keep changing my outfit and making sure I'm not repeating shirts or anything. <laughs> <laughs> but seven rare disease days, I've got enough in my closet, I think. <laughs> That's awesome. You'll be dreaming about us all, Kristen. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love the zebra stuff. So it doesn't, you know, it, at least it, 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 uh, it's a pattern I like. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, Kristen, we still have about 15 minutes left, correct, of our program? Yeah, yeah. Okay, what about, and I'm Sophia and Jessica, what do you guys think if we open it up, if there's anyone on who would like to um, just have like an open floor, if they would like to share their rare story, um, if they have any ideas for us about events or topics, just make it open. If you like to share, I cannot see you all. Just go ahead and um, I don't know if you have the power to unmute yourself. Um, raise a hand, unmute yourself if you can. Ashley. Um, hi everybody, I just wanted to say hi and um, it's so great to see you all um, tonight and uh, really glad to be here with you and everybody and um, to welcoming um, the families that are here tonight. Um, we're all here um, in this um, and in this community together and um, I hope you know that we're all, uh, you know, I'm, I'm and we're all with you. Uh, so just wanted to mention that. Um, I have a, um, a, my rare disease is hermansky pudlak syndrome. And um, it's, I, uh, I was diagnosed with it actually when I was very young as well. Um, and uh, it's, um, it's pulmonary fibrosis um, that we actually, a lot of us have as we get older. Um, it's a bleeding condition um, from um, a platelet dysfunction. And it also has Crohn's like colitis um, along with a few um, other, other autoimmune things that come with it. Um, and it all um, happens in one gene. So, and we have 11 uh, various types. Um, as we know of so far. And uh, we're also um, legally blind as well. It's a type of albinism. Um, so uh, we're legally blind as well uh, with, uh, with it. Thank you so much, Ashley, for sharing. For those of you that follow our Facebook page, if Ashley looks familiar, she was one of the, the first people that we highlighted um, as our one of our rare stories this month. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you. Anyone else? Actually, your mom was honored at the Rare Impact Awards last year, right? For the organization. Yes, um, she was. Um, she uh, she was um, uh, she she was in uh, got the Rare Impact last year. Um, uh, f uh, for um, she she's um, she she founded the Hermansky Pudlak Syndrome Network, um, and at the time um, there were only about twenty people in the country that had it uh, when it was founded and uh, when I was diagnosed with it. And she just, she wanted to gather all the people. And um, with gathering all the people, she wanted to form a community um, in hopes that we can strive to do something about this and about, about the condition. Well, you guys are all wonderful. You know, Nord loves you guys. So Aww. thanks for sharing. Oh, we love you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else like a chance to speak? Mary? Yes. Am I allowed to just mention um, the radio show tomorrow? Yes? Sure. Okay. So um, if anybody has the chance, we're actually broadcasting on 88.7 at 7 p.m. tomorrow, which is Hofstra University radio station. I'll be speaking again, um, trying to raise awareness about rare diseases. And we will actually be publicly debuting three of the original songs from the documentary. 
um, that my daughter sings. So hopefully you can tune in. So thank you. Hey, it looks like we have some hands raised too. I always forget about that function, but just to give you guys a heads up, it looks like Danielle raised her hand there. Sorry, I was muted. Um, we have, um, I didn't think to mention if anyone has Amazon Prime, Team San Filippo Foundation has a documentary. It's about a half an hour long that helps um, explain San Filippo more in depth. Um, I'm on it, Emily's on it, our executive board members and kids, and it's called The Weight of a Mountain. So it's, uh, it, it, of course, I think it's great. <laughs> you know, it's our kids, it's our story. So I love it, but it, it really is really well done. So if you have a half an hour, you know, to kind of sit back and watch and you have Amazon Prime, we would love to have somebody else watch it, give comments, give us some feedback, let us know, you know, if we go to make another one, um, you know, if you liked what you saw, if it was informational. Danielle, can you repeat the name of it? Yeah, it's called The Weight of a Mountain. Because the, uh, the one father who had two sons, he's on our executive board, he actually has now climbed four different mountains um, to raise money for some of the clinical trials that we fund and also to, you know, do the best that he can to mimic, not mimic at all, but to show the fight. You know, the kids have this fight, so I'm going to fight. Um, you know, he's in Mexico. He's done Kilimanjaro. He's done, um, oh gosh, forget it. <laughs> you have to go on there. <laughs> he's going to kill me for forgetting the mountains he's climbed. Do you remember? Oh my gosh, there's four. Sorry, Carl. It's anyway, Carl Capes, so right? The Weight of a Mountain, it's a fantastic documentary. It is very, it's, a, it's really informative. Cool, thank you. It's only 33 minutes for anybody. I just looked it up, so. Oh, watch it, please. Yeah, 33 minutes is not like, you know, anything crazy. I think that's, that's awesome. bathroom TV. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Just to be real. Yeah. Jason has his hand up too. Jason, do you have something to add? I think he forgot to put his hand down. <laughs> his hand got stuck when he was putting the outfit on. Yeah, I think he went to change. I think he stepped away. I'm back. We had a meltdown. <laughs> I made it back. We melted. I can say um, if you want to hear more about Jason's story um, and Ashley's story and Soon, Danielle's, Danielle's family story. We do have um, patient stories highlighted on our Facebook pages, and they're amazing. So go follow us and like us and listen to the stories. <sighs> and so if you would like to have your story, your rare story highlighted, please email us and let us know. Um, and we'll be continuing to highlight patient rare stories on our Facebook page. Um, it'll be a way to get the word out and bring awareness to your rare disease. So, the work that the New York RAND does in the state of New York is fantastic. And I want to just, you know, again, acknowledge Mary, Jessica, Sophia, Benji, all of you, Jason, you know, all of you on this call just joining today and, and using your voice to raise the awareness for rare diseases. Um, the most important thing you can bring to a legislator's office is your voice and your story. So we thank you guys for sharing your stories and continuing, you know, that um, without you guys doing that. Um, and for, I'm sorry, there's a very active puppy that's been cooped up all day that is <laughs> tearing apart my house right now. Um, but, you know, thank you guys for sharing your stories and continue to share your stories and, and, and work with, with these guys, work with us. Um, with the Rare Action Network in New York, and, and let's really build a solid unified network of grassroots advocates that are ready to, you know,
take on Capitol Hill, um, both on the state and federal level when it comes time. Uh, there's, there's plenty of issues, there's plenty of work to be done. Um, we're only just beginning. So let's all, you know, work together to achieve those. And, you know, we can't have the success we have with getting legislation passed, um, you know, without our advocates. So thank you guys all for, for participating today and, and continuing to support you know, the work of Nord and, and just, you know, being an advocate for yourselves and your loved ones. And please watch your email in the coming weeks uh, for the dates for our virtual chats that are starting back up this spring. Okay. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Be in touch. Stay well. Oh, great to see you all. You too. Bye. Good night. Bye. Good night.